Well, good evening and welcome back to the Journey Home program. I'm your host, John Mark Grodi, here on EWTN. And once again, we have this great privilege to sit back, relax, have a cup of coffee, and hear a conversion story. Uh, this, this way, this preeminent way that the gospel takes root in a particular person's life, in a particular story, a particular journey, uh, and then this, this, uh, this aspect of being Christian, which is to share it with another person. It's a beautiful thing, and we're, we're, we're just privileged to be able to be witness to it here on this show. We're joined by Lisa Cooper tonight. She's former Word of Faith, and we're going to hear all about that particular background uh, here in a moment. But Lisa, thanks so much for joining us tonight. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. It's a, it's a great privilege, and so excited to dig into your story tonight. So where, do, where does it begin? Where would you say, where do you want to start this story off, huh? Well, uh, I guess most people probably don't start with their infancy. <laughs> I, but, was, I um, was bored. Actually, yes. I, was, uh, I was baptized Catholic. Sure. Um, sure. My parents were just young enough, and I was their oldest child. And I think my mom still was young enough to be afraid of my grandmother, who was hysterical <laughs> and um, worried that I was going to go to hell. She was Catholic. And so she insisted that I be baptized in the church. My mom acquiesced, I think, more than anything, just for the peace of her right. being quiet. Um, and it's interesting because I look back at pictures of my baptism, and it's just a bunch of people standing around making promises that they had no intention of keeping. Mm. Um, not that my mom wasn't going to raise me Christian, yeah. but my dad was a lapsed Catholic, and so he was, he was trying to figure out his own life. Um, my godparents were wonderful people, but I just I wasn't in touch with them. Um, growing up. Um, but I, as I look back on that, I think it doesn't matter what those intentions were. The Holy Spirit took that very seriously. Amen. Um, he put that mark on me. And I always say that it was the graces of my baptism and the prayers of the Blessed Mother that brought me home. Uh, and I think that sustained me um, through my life because I had, you know, quite the roller coaster ride. Absolutely. Yeah, that's it's always interesting some of those those background pieces who was praying for me you know uh, even that again that sacrament is efficacious mm -hmm. even if the people's hearts are in all kinds of different places it's right yeah. absolutely yeah. yeah so when I was young um, my mom was raised Baptist and she I think was looking for something um, that was more deeply meaningful for her and so we did a lot of church shopping and nothing really fit, nothing really felt right. And, you know, as a youngster, you know how that is. You're I'm sitting in one Sunday school class after another, feeling like the only kid that no one doesn't know and, right. uh, I mean, that no one knows. And so everything just felt artificial. Um, and then my father started off as a salesman for a company and was promoted to management. And it turned out he had quite um, the acumen for being a fixer. And so they would promote him to different branches that were underperforming so he could go and turn them around. Wow. So we were on the move quite a bit as a family. And our first move was to Corpus Christi, Texas, um, not ironically. <laughs> and um, it was there that my mom encountered the Word of Faith movement. And she got what we call turned on to the Word. And really it was there that the, the entire atmosphere, the energy of my family changed. Um, my dad, we kind of laughed. My dad got saved at the kitchen table, um, but it's kind of our family joke. It didn't take yet for him <laughs> because he still had a lot of things that he had to work through um, from his own childhood. But my mother held on to that with everything that she was. And I, um, even though I'm not part of that faith, I so admire her strength and her conviction and the fact that she just 100% sold out to God and said, I believe this, I'm going to stand in this, I'm going to raise my children this way. Um, and so that was really when my faith formation, Word of Faith, happened. Um, I encountered all of these names for the first time, Kenneth Hagin, Kenneth Copeland, Charles Capps, Fred Price, Jerry Savelle, Marilyn Hickey. We were getting, uh, my aunt and uncle had... Um, a Christian bookstore, a, a Word of Faith bookstore. So they were sending us, all, you know, it was right when everybody was taping their sermons and things. And so we were getting all these tapes and all these books. And really at that time, there was no Word of Faith churches. People really weren't doing churches. Right. Um, and they were really the original Word of Faith churches 
were kind of modeled after early Christian science. Um, they were teaching sinners. In fact, the name of our church when I finally moved and started going to a church was called Word of Life Center. Hmm. Um, it wasn't called a church right. because they were really looking to be anti-religious. Um, this was about coming and learning the Word and hearing the Word of God and letting it take root in your heart and really eschewing all those things, religion. Um, and so I learned, I guess I was probably in maybe second or third grade, that religion was something to run from. It was going to rob me of a real life with Jesus. Um, I started to learn who I was, that uh, this, this very Gnostic idea that I am spirit, the real me is a spirit, that I have um, a soul, which was the seat of my mind, my will, and my emotions, and then I just lived in this body, and that my body was really kind of of no consequence. It was kind of an earth suit, I think I've heard people say, that it was just the mechanism by which I was able to survive on the earth. And I understood that everything that was real happened in the spirit. Um, it was there that I had this new sort of take on creation, that God spoke everything into existence, that he had created these spiritual laws, and that it was actually his faith that enabled everything to come into existence. Um, we were reading books by E.W. Kenyon, who really was, really was the father of the Word of Faith movement, prosperity gospel sort of evolved from that okay. um, later on. But this point in my life was kind of just laying that foundation. But it also was a point where I began to understand really the gravity of the words that come out of my mouth. Mm -hmm. And so our vocabulary, even as a family, changed. My mom forbade any kind of fear, any kind of doubt, any kind of unbelief, any kind of poverty speaking, we were not allowed. So I have two younger brothers. And um, if one of my brothers jumped out from behind the door, I wasn't allowed to say, hey, you scared me, because that was speaking fear. And we didn't speak fear in our family. Interesting, interesting. Um, I wasn't allowed to say, oh, God, poor thing. You know, if there was some puppy that we found, um, because that's speaking poverty, and we don't we don't talk about poverty in our family, and we never said that someone died. Um, they went home to be with the Lord. Death was of the devil, um, and so we just said they went home to be with the Lord. And I'm not sure what we said if we weren't sure that they went to heaven. I think we just said they passed away. That was at least um, an open question, though, in your right. tradition. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. So. You know, Corpus Christi was, um, that was kind of where faith really started. For me, we, like I said, we listened to lots of tapes. And so my mom was very much part of this sort of faith community that came together and we would meet in people's living rooms and we would pray and then we would listen to someone's sermon. And, um, you know, interestingly, as a child, I was very much part of that world. We didn't have kids' church or anything like that. And so I was reading Kenneth Hagin's books, and I was reading E.W. Kenyon's books and learning right along with my mom, really, all of this. Um, and I think one other thing that was really important in my formation that I got at this point was this idea that there were these kind of spiritual supermen. I mean, people who had... I mean, Kenyon says that, that there's sense knowledge and there's revelation knowledge. Um, and really, he's, he's very direct in that everything that he writes is along those lines. And so everything is this warfare between the spirit and the body. But there were these men like Kenneth Hagin, like Kenneth Copeland, like Jerry Savelle, but um, who had mastered this ability to walk in the spirit. Um, but particularly Kenneth Hagin, whose testimony uh, book was called I Believe in Visions. And I read that and found that his mother had been literally stopped in her tracks walking to her mother's house. By the Holy Spirit, this wind came. She was pregnant with um, Hagin and got this revelation that he was going to be this world changer, um, that he was going to have this tremendous impact on the world. 
and um, he tells the story of his kind of deathbed conversion where Jesus himself appeared to him and gave him this revelation from Mark eleven twenty three, 23. Whoever says unto this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea and should not doubt in his heart will have whatever he says. And so that was really the foundation of everything that I believed, that you had this mechanism through which you controlled your reality, through which you controlled your life, through which you controlled the world. And that was through the confession of your mouth. And my job was to align everything I said with what God said. Um, And I was talking to a friend last night about this. I said, you know, your adult logical mind says, well, that's, I mean, how could somebody believe that? But I said, understand that this was part of my formation when I still believed in Santa Claus. I I was deeply impressionable. And if an adult said something to me, I said, okay. And here was this man who was otherworldly. I mean, he had seen Jesus. He said that he died and went to hell and went to heaven. I mean, he had seen all these things and done all these things. And so I began also to consider that there were people who had an authority because of their proximity to Jesus. And they had a right to speak certain things into my life. And I had a responsibility to listen to that. We're speaking tonight with Lisa Cooper, former Word of Faith. Yeah, such an interesting, as you said, receiving at this point in your life. Um, and, and obviously there's a mixture, you know, of, of some really good things in your upbringing and your experience, along with some things that I will, you'll dig into later, you know, really problematic. Um, but particularly at a time where you want, right? You want God, you want. And so it's all coming in together at that time period in your life. Yeah, well, and I think, you know, I wanted God, Mm -hmm. um, but I wanted to be good. I wanted to be a good person. And I think more than the sort of adult sense of, of wanting to obey God and wanting to do things God's way, I wanted God to love me. I wanted him to approve of me. And here were all these people who knew God. I mean, knew him personally. Um, And so I was entirely susceptible to everything that they said. Um, I took it in and um, (laughs) was quite the weirdo, right? Like this little third grade girl who's speaking to all these things and, Mm -hmm. and has this strange idea of God and faith. And, um, you know, and I'm walking around in Corpus Christi among all these beautiful, wonderful Catholics um, who were just gracious and kind of winked at me, I guess. What with that desire, that childlike desire for something that is ultimately what we're called for. You know? Right, absolutely. But, but not being in the right place at that necessarily to, right. to receive it at that point yeah. in your life. Wow. Right. So from there, from Corpus Christi, we moved to Lafayette, Louisiana. Um, and that's kind of where I I'm, had this interesting crossroads um, because I was baptized Catholic, but I didn't even have any knowledge of being baptized Catholic until I was much older and saw my baby book and went, who's this kid? (laughs) My mom said, well, that's you. Um, But I had been, I always say I was raised alongside the Catholic Church because my grandmother was Catholic. And when we moved to Lafayette, I was in very close proximity to my grandmother uh, who lived in Alexandria, which is just about an hour and a half, I guess, north of that. Um, And Lafayette is in South Louisiana. It's a deeply Catholic community. Um, And so I had you know, Catholic friends, and I would go to Mass with my friends, and of course my grandmother would um, take me to Mass. She snuck me in to have my first communion. I mean, she was just, she was something. She really was wonderful and funny. But, um, so I, you know, went to Catholic school, and I think I sort of had two two things going in terms of my my um, experience with the Catholic Church. One was I was absolutely taken with the beauty of the church, the beauty of the liturgy. There was something deeply meaningful even then, even when I wasn't properly catechized, to bow, to kneel, um, to have these gestures that told my body, you know, my body telling me this is important. Right. 
there's something significant happening here. Um, and it, you know, for somebody who went to church in the living room, to go into these places that felt majestic. Um, you know, I think there are people who criticize the Catholic Church for the money that's spent on the churches. And I had, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but I had the great opportunity um, to go to Italy and go in some of these churches. And I think about being uneducated and walking into these churches and all it does, it almost lifts you out of your skin with a desire to go to heaven. Yeah. Because you think if this can be so beautiful, if this can steal my breath the moment I walk in the door, what must it be like to be face to face with God? Um, and that's really, that's what the church did. I mean, it was so beautiful. I was taken with it. Um, and then, you know, middle school and high school and you don't want to be a weirdo. You just want to be with, with your friends. You want to do what other kids do. Um, and so it was an easy way for me to kind of fit in was just to go to church with them and do things with them. But, you know, they were all marching toward confirmation. And of course, my mother wouldn't hear of it. Um, and at that time, I don't think I was really in a position to make that kind of a decision and really know what was happening. Um, but I do remember when we were, I think, I guess probably in seventh grade, and I'm sure almost everybody in Catholic school remembers this, it was, you know, rosary day, and we all made our own rosaries, and we learned how to pray the rosary, and we took our rosaries to Monsignor, who blessed them, and I thought that was the coolest thing I'd ever seen. I mean, I just, the, the whole idea of praying the rosary, and all the prayers, they were so beautiful to me, and and even then, I had this unexplainable devotion to Our Lady. It, it was just kind of a, I don't know, it just felt like there was a woman who was looking out for me. And um, I had never really experienced that before. Yeah. Um, and so, boy, I would pray my little rosary and it would make my mother so mad oh, she would just get so mad at me. And um, I remember this time I was praying the Hail Mary and standing in the kitchen. And my mother just stopped in her tracks and turned around and she said, why would you pray a prayer like that? Why would you say that? Hail Mary. Why are we hailing Mary? You know, is that what you're doing? Are you praising Mary? Are you worshiping Mary? And of course that came from her complete misunderstanding, sure. right, of our devotion right. um, to Our Lady and I, you know, I didn't want to make my mom mad. I didn't want to displease my parents. Um, I think at that point, my dad was just kind of let your mom handle it. You know, whatever your mom says, just please do what your mom says. Um, and so I had this rosary that I was really proud of because I made it. Um, and I was really proud of because it was the first thing in my life that had to do with God and it felt tangible. It felt like I could hold Our Lady's hand and think about Jesus. Um, and for whatever reason, that was important to me then. Right. Um, so I put it away because I didn't want to make my mom mad. Um, and my Mimi, my grandmother, had heard about that, and she gave me her rosary, which was this beautiful little delicate sterling little filigree and it was in you know those little look like a little pill box those little, little yeah. rosary box it was so lovely and I just kept it kind of tucked away and really didn't think much about it um, but that would come into play later in my life yeah it's so interesting that the the, the um, this immense desire and the sense of, of being home being close to Our Lady uh, in the context of having been raised with to be very anti-religion as you said the, the structures, the rote prayers, the, uh, but we have a yearning for that. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a very human yearning. Yeah. It's also interesting to see how that, that, that again, even when those things are rejected in terms of the, the Catholic roots, things arise to take their place, right? Mm -hmm. People, ways of praying, ways of, they still, they arise just in a different form. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and I think, I think it's funny because even in our rejection of something, 
we conform to the group of people who are rejecting it in a particular way, right? right? Like we reject it this way, and so we all do these things. I mean, we're always conforming, yeah. always conforming. Yeah. Um, so uh, from Lafayette, we ended up moving to Denver, and that was just kind of an odd time for me because Denver's a different place yeah. for sure. Um, but I, we went to Marilyn Hickey's church there, who is very much a um, prosperity gospel, word of faith woman, and I was actually kind of taken with her um, because she's wicked smart. I mean, crazy smart woman. Um, and the first time I ever really heard a woman line upon line teach the Bible. And I thought that that was pretty neat, even though, you know, in retrospect, I think, wow, that was some crazy things that you were teaching. <laughs> um, but I liked the way that she dug into things and, and she definitely was a natural teacher. And so I appreciated that about her. Um, but Denver was kind of a kind of a blip, and my mom, who was a Louisiana girl, was ready to go home. And so my dad said, you know, requested, you know, I want to go home. And at that time, he had started serving God, and I think more than anything, wanted to make up for hauling his family all over the place and letting us put down roots somewhere. And by that time, I was out of high school and getting ready to start college. And so when we first moved back, um, I think that was that moment where I'd kind of gotten over my fear of everything and everyone. And I had probably about a year and a half where I was just rebellious. I just didn't care. Um, I don't think I ever really rebelled against God openly. Um, I mean, there were people that I knew who, who did things that I thought were disrespectful of God. And I was quick to call them out on that. Like, you know, hey, we're being, we're being crazy, but we're not, we're not that crazy. You know, we're not going to do that. We're going to disrespect God. Um, because I did still fear God, you know. I mean, I didn't want to um, condemn myself. And I didn't want to dishonor God, even though I still thought that He wasn't that crazy about me, mm. you know. Um, I never thought that I was enough. For God, and I think a lot of that came from, you know, all of that teaching, that prosperity gospel teaching, um, because my life wasn't something that I made it out to be. I mean, I was praying, I was confessing, I was doing all my stuff, and I was struggling. I was sad, um, and I didn't realize that a lot of what I was going through. Some of it was just the human condition, right? right? Um, and some of it was just being raised in a very challenging atmosphere and having some things happen to me when I was young that um, push people into a mental space where they're just not, you know, they're not at peace. Right. Um, but I didn't understand that. And when I was struggling, you know, my mom's answer and the church's answer was, well, you, you got to do your confessions. You got to get your confessions. And so I have my little notebook out and I would write down scriptures and I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And, you know, all through Deuteronomy 28, God's made me the head and not the tail. I'll be above only and not beneath. He'll bless everything I put my hand to. I mean, I knew all these things by the stripes of Jesus. I've been healed, you know, healed in my soul, healed in my mind, healed in my body. I mean, just constantly, constantly, constantly kind of offering up these offerings of, of confession every day. And then afraid that I'm not saying it right or I'm not really believing it in my heart because I feel this way and, you know, I still feel sad and I can't be moved by that. You know, I've got to be right. standing on my faith. Um, and so when I was in college, um, I, you know, I grew very tired very quickly of just that nonsense of not living for God. It just didn't suit me very well. And so it didn't take me long. I always laugh and say, I kind of quit doing at 21 what everyone started doing. <laughs> um, and I was ready to come home. Um, and so uh, funny enough, Jesse Duplantis was speaking at our church and I answered an altar call um, at the Jesse Duplantis meeting. Um, and so I, I had a little blip after that of not sure that I want to fully come back into the church. And then just very quietly, um, I came back and I started reading my Bible, you know, by myself and digging into things and just asking God to help me, 
um, I just, I wanted to feel good. Um, not like, Hey, I just want to be in a great mood every day, but I wanted to feel at peace. Yeah. Um, and again, I just wanted God to approve of me. I wanted him to be proud of me. I wanted him to be glad that he made me. And I think a lot of people felt like, I, I felt like a lot of people, which was, I know John 3, 16, but I felt like God died for someone else. And I just kind of got in on the deal, you know, like he died for people who were genuinely good or who were doing it right. And, um, I thought, okay, well, I'm going to go to heaven because, you know, I'm serving God. I love God. But I always felt like there was this kind of distance between God and me. Um, and when I was coming back into the church, I don't know if you know much about the shepherding movement, but that was sort of having this resurgence, which um, I think Bob Mumford was the one who kind of started that. But it was this idea that pastors had a particular responsibility and therefore a particular grace because they had a responsibility for the souls of their flock and they had an authority over the souls of their flock. And we really were not supposed to um, make major life decisions without the approval of our pastor that he heard from the Holy Spirit in a particular way so that he could guide us in a wisdom that was divinely given to him. Um, a guy named John Brevere wrote a book called Undercover, and it really kind of outlined that and also outlined this particular honor that the men of God were supposed to be getting. Um, you know, and I, I don't mean this disparagingly about my pastor. I know that if I called my pastor from this chair and said, I need help, he would move heaven and earth to help me. But I think that he was deceived. And I think that there was um, just some things that started to go on in the church that kind of made me give the side eye a little bit. Um, why do you have your staff taking your car to be washed? Why are people meeting you at your car so they can carry your Bible? Um, why is someone holding an umbrella for you? Um, and he was, our pastor was, I mean, that was very minor. I mean, there were pastors out there who literally had people take him home after church on Sunday and dress him in his bed clothes and put him to bed. Um, there were people who would cut their food for them. Um, there were people who, when these pastors would get up to speak, their job was to get up and wipe the sweat um, from his brow. And I thought, well, that's, that's a little crazy. Um, but I also, you know, with that came also this sort of threat of if you speak out against the man of God, that's God's anointed. Um, you know, and the Bible says you will not touch God's anointed. You'll be judged for that. So you don't dare gossip about the pastor. You don't criticize the pastor. Um, Benny Hinn was quoted as saying, if you talk about me, you criticize me, your children will pay for it. Wow. Um, so there were these sort of threats that were being issued. I mean, my pastor, even though I don't think he intended for it to come off this way, he said, you know, this man testified against me in court and his wife got cancer. Wow. And so you're, you're afraid to question what's being preached. You know, on, in one breath, it's, um, well, don't take my word for it. Go read the Bible for yourself. But then it's also, you know, men like Kenneth Hagin saying, I, the Lord gave me this revelation. The Holy Spirit told me that if I gave this revelation at a church and the pastor didn't receive it, he would drop dead in the pulpit. I mean, this is in his book, I Believe in Visions. And he said, and sure enough, I shared it and I was grieved to hear that a man had dropped dead in his pulpit because he rejected my teaching. So you don't advocate for yourself in a situation like that. You, you figure out what's wrong with you. Um, if you are questioning, God, help me overcome this doubt. God, help me receive this word. Yeah. Help me be a better Christian. Help me do this because I'm failing at this. I'm having my doubts. I know it's not this pastor's fault or this minister's fault because they are anointed of you. 
So it's got to be me. It has to be me. Which and sort of just circles back around on that 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 dis-ease, that lack of peace, not being able to know where you stand with God. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. And don't forget, too, I mean, I, I neglected to mention this, but, you know, the Word of Faith movement is highly charismatic. I mean, you're, you're speaking in tongues at five years old, and, and everything is about the manifestation of the Holy Spirit. And so we're, you know, we're having church, and it's the Holy Ghost move. We're going to let the Holy Ghost have the service tonight. And, and boy, we were all excited and sitting up in our chairs because maybe we were going to get a word. Right. You know, I want God to speak to me. And I'll tell you this, you know, people ask me all the time, why, what's the, what's the appeal? Because they think it's, well, I just want to be rich. And almost no one is word of faith because they want to be rich. Right. Um, it's, if you can imagine living your life where you are, let's say you're Catholic, because people ask me, why are my kids leaving and going to these churches? Let's say you're Catholic and you're at Mass and you don't understand the Mass. You're not really catechized. You don't really, you haven't done the reading. You haven't learned the significance of, of the beauty of the faith. And you're struggling and there's not really a big fellowship, you know, kind of feel at your church. And your friend at work keeps bugging you about going to their ridiculous mega church. And you finally give in and you go with your friend and you get there and you're parked in Egypt and here comes somebody in a golf cart to get you from your car and they hand you a cup of coffee or some hot chocolate as soon as you get in the golf cart and they greet you and they tell you how glad they are to see you and they hope you have a great day and then you get wheeled in right to the church and um, when you're in there you walk in at first you think it's kind of weird and you know all these people like super friendly and they're greeting you at the door and we're so glad you came to join us today and if there's anything we can do for you let us know and you go into the church and all of a sudden the lights go down and this music starts and it's like a concert and then it's like this up tempo and everybody's excited and then it it slows down and and it's just this cadence, right, of God, I need you. God, I love you. God, come and heal me. God, hear my heart. God, I need you. God, I love you. God, come and heal me, right? And then the minister comes out, and he has this message of how much God loves you and how important you are to him and how he wants you to live this incredible life, that he's called you to this incredible life. And he says, you know what? We're going to let the Holy Spirit have the service tonight. And he comes up to you. And he says, I want to tell you something. What's your name? Stand up. I have something to tell you by the Holy Spirit. God says, I've heard your cries. I've heard you. I've seen you on your knees. I know the struggles that you're having. And I want you to know, I love you. I've called you. And I have more for you. I mean... You talk about being lifted out of your skin, right? And so then when all this is over, you get ushered to the back and the pastor himself comes out and shakes your hand and says, wow, gosh, I'm so glad to meet you. Thank you. I'm honored that you came to be with us today. And then they give you this bag of gifts. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like it's a whole different experience. Yeah. Um, and they don't tell you what happens when you go to church. And you don't feel the presence of God. Right. What happens the first time you go and you don't feel that anymore? Mm -hmm. And that's really what, what happened to me. Yeah, I, you know, the beginning, of it, beginning and end uh, were made for happiness. And we have that longing in our heart. And so it, that's, if we're not finding that, it doesn't mean we chase feelings. But it's that that is what we're called to. And so, again, in, in this context, yes, it's very clear from the testimony, like, how that would meet someone who's not hasn't it hasn't clicked for them yet they haven't found God um, but let's let's hear the rest of the story let's take a, just a quick break we'll get back to it uh, to your story Lisa um, we'll be back in just a minute to hear the rest of Lisa's story see you then.
Welcome back to the Journey Home program. We're ending the second half of the hour tonight talking to Lisa Cooper, former Word of Faith. Uh, that's her background and an exciting story, Lisa. I mean, com- compelling, um, t- talking about that experience of sort of this Pentecostal Word of Faith type experience and how, I mean, that, as you were just telling us before the break, I mean, that um, it speaks to something that, that people are longing for. Mm-hmm. And there are issues with that back, the background, that that church, that movement that you're going to talk about, but it's certainly there's a part of it that it, that's that's touching something deep in us. Um, but it, pick pick up where you left off. And sure, yeah. Uh, well, yeah. I mean, you wouldn't be involved in any kind of faith if it wasn't meeting a need, hmm. right? Um, so for me, what I found myself doing was sort of living Sunday to Sunday. Or actually, we went to church Sunday and Wednesday and Saturday and all these days, but living from service to service trying to recapture that uh, almost religious ecstasy um, of being in this time with God, because that was when I felt peace. It was almost like a drug. You know, that was when I felt at peace. Um, And really, at this point, I was married. I was in an unsacramental marriage. It was very challenging. Um, And so, you know, I would go home to some tough challenges there. And so I was really wanting things to turn around in my life Um, in terms of finances. We were not doing well Um, in terms of living a real Christian life, uh, living in true charity. We were not doing well, and but we felt the Holy Ghost, right? We felt the Holy Spirit, and I would go forward um, like I was supposed to uh, at at any time. There was not really an altar call, but come forward and and let the Holy Ghost touch you. And so I would go forward and, you know, fall back, get slain in the spirit like I was supposed to. Um, And we had this weird move um, that was sort of kind of came in, this whim that came in with a minister called named Rodney Howard Brown. He was South African, lives in Florida now. But it was this wave of holy laughter uh, that came through the church. And it was insane. It was insane. And everyone was getting wrapped up in, I mean, entire like hours of church services where we would go in and the music would start and then someone would start to giggle and that would be it. And when I tell you, it was like people would say, um, our pastor would say, quote the scripture, I think it was from Joel, this is that spoken by the Holy Spirit and talk about um, when all of the um, disciples and apostles came down from the upper room and people thought they were drunk, right, from the Holy Spirit. And and it was like a church full of drunks. I mean, people were chicken dancing across the stage and running around the church. I mean, literally running around inside the church. And one man ran and ran into the wall and broke his arm or his leg. I can't remember. And he kind of laughed and said, ah, I guess I probably shouldn't have taken that last lap. But it was this maniacal laughter. And it was, you know, and then it would turn into this like moaning and groaning in the spirit. And I was, I felt suddenly like I was standing in the middle of a crazy town. And I actually desperately wanted to be part of it because everybody seemed like they were in some level of spirituality that I just wasn't. And I really thought there was something wrong with me. And people would lay hands on me. You know, it's like people who aren't ticklish and you go, feel the tickle. (laughs) You know, you're just trying to, you know, be like everybody else. And I just couldn't. I mean, I would fake it. I would try to muster it, you know, like that ridiculous, you know, when you try to make yourself yeah, laugh right, and right. it wasn't there. Um, and I remember people just saying, it's just so easy. You know, I just slip right in. And, you know, people would say, you just have to press in. You just have to press in. And I thought, I'm pressing God. I mean, and it got to the point that it drove me to the edge of absolute depression because I thought, God really doesn't want to have anything to do with me. So we had a man come in and speak. Um, his name was Ken Stewart. And he 
had us all lined up at the front of the church and he was laying hands on all of us and everybody was dropping, you know, like we were supposed to. And I kind of resolved in my heart and I said, God, if this is something for me, you sweep me off my feet, but I'm not budging. And I, he went person, 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 and everyone fell out. And I was the lone person standing at the front. And I felt stupid and I felt like I wasn't a Christian and I felt like, and I know Mm. people were just like, what's up with Lisa? You know, poor thing. Although they would never say that because that's poverty. (laughs) But, um, but I went back to my seat and I sobbed. I mean, I thought I'm probably going to hell um, because God clearly doesn't want to have anything to do with me. And looking back, I think it was the graces of my baptism that were protecting me Hmm. from that because that was just foolish. Um, But I also did not like what the faith movement was doing to me as a person. Aside from that, um, I was incredibly arrogant I knew everything there was to know about the Bible. I knew scripture inside and out. You know, people talk about the book of Job, and I would say, Job got what he got because he was in fear. I mean, just read it. It tells you he offered sacrifices day and night because he was in fear. If he hadn't been in fear, none of those things would have happened to him. I mean, that's pretty glib, right, to explain the entire book of Job with that. Um, And there was also this sort of elitism People would have these testimonies at church where it was hailing. It was hailing and it was destroying my neighbor's yard, but the hail never touched my house, never touched my car. And I thought, even then, even in my own arrogance, I thought, I don't think that's God's way of looking at the world. I just protect you and too bad for you if you're not in on this deal. Right. Um, I've shared this before, but a woman with whom I worked had had a miscarriage. I'm, and I'm so embarrassed to say this, but I walked in right after she lost her baby and said, are you tithing? Because the Bible says that if you tithe, you, your fruit will not cast, or your vine will not cast its fruit before the time. And she is sobbing, poor thing, in the bathroom. Yes, we were tithing, and that's why I don't understand why this happened to me. Well, then I got nothing to say. Like, I think I'm coming in with all these answers, right? If you just give your tithe, you know, you can keep your children. Look how easy it is for me. I have children. It's fine. Um, And I kind of got to look at myself in the mirror and thought, God, I don't like who I am. I don't like this. Um, And so my uh, husband and I moved to Austin, Texas to start our own church. That was a hot mess. Because we didn't know what we were doing. We really didn't have the backing of our church. Um, My husband at the time and my pastor had a falling out. And I was terrified because I thought, you've separated yourself from the man of God. And we may as well be on the Titanic. Um, But we met some wonderful people. And I had some encounters with God um, that were amazing. And um, God... So God just started to work miracles in my life when we had separated and were in Austin. Um, And we were driving and I saw this billboard, this calling Catholics home billboard and something on the inside of me went, I wish. And I thought, where did that come from? (laughs) I don't want to be Catholic. Um, And God had done some things. He blessed me with two more children, which I didn't know that I was going to have, didn't expect to have. Um, Because I had prayed a prayer and just said, God, make my family what it's supposed to be. And God started to intervene in my life and show me that he was really the one who had been in control this whole time. And that if I would just let go and quit trying to speak my life into existence, he probably had some things in mind for me that I really and truly couldn't have imagined that were so beyond having the biggest house on the block, right? Um, So when we moved back from Austin... Um, my marriage was going to fail. I knew that, um, we were pastoring a church and that was going to fail. And I knew that. Um, and I said to my husband at the time, like, I feel like I've been through a war and I'm just 
wearing field dressing and I've got to go get healed from this and I need to go to a counselor and I need to figure out what's going on with my faith. And because I had been baptized Catholic and had sort of peeked over the fence into the Catholic church, I really had no intention of being Catholic, but I thought I'm just going to start with the only other thing I know. And once I started to read about the early church fathers and read about the liturgy and understand the symbolism and the significance of everything in the church, I really leaned into the scaffolding of the liturgy. Yeah. I needed order. I needed something that was predictable and at the same time mysterious and beautiful. And that was everything that the church was. And I would come home, I would read something and come home um, to my husband and say, I read this thing. Let me tell you about this. Tell me what you think about this. And he would say, all I know is I don't want to be married to you if you're Catholic. And I don't want to talk about this. And I would go to my father-in-law who was a minister and I would say, I brought um, Scott Hahn's book and said, please read this because I think I want to be Catholic and to help me, like tell me if I'm being deceived. And so what started to happen is there was a buzz in my community that I was going to join the Catholic Church and all hell broke loose when that happened. Um, my former pastor had gotten wind of it and had run into my husband at the time and said, is Lisa becoming Catholic? And he, my husband said, yes. And he said, oh God, that just, he said, that grieves my spirit. That grieves my spirit for her. And I was afraid, right? This is a man of God. And another pastor in town had called me into his office and um, he was somebody with whom we had a close relationship. And he said, um, he always called me baby girl and somebody I looked up to. Well, I saw a very different side of him that day. He said, you sit in that chair right there and I'm going to tell you something. He said, what you're doing is demonic. He said, the Catholic church is demonic. And all this, your church shutting down in Austin had nothing to do with your ex-husband. It's you. You have the spirit of the world on you. Mm. And he said, this has nothing to do with you. This is about your oldest son. And if you do this thing, if you leave this marriage, if you go into the Catholic church, I'm telling you by the spirit of God, the devil is going to take your son from you. And I just went and sat in my car and I cried. And um, I mean, I kind of laugh because I live in the South and everybody has a gun in the South. And I thought, I wonder how I could get my dad's gun. Like, where could I kill myself? Like, where could I hide so that nobody would find me? Like, I couldn't risk my kids finding me, you know? But I thought everything that I thought was true, you know? Like this whole idea of not feeling the presence of God because he, he disapproves of me. Um, I had fasted and prayed for 40 days up to that point, And this pastor had said to me, I know you fasted and prayed for 40 days, but that doesn't mean anything. Mm. And he said, I'm telling you this by the spirit of God. And I thought, I don't know what to do, you know, because my earnest desire had always been to love God, to serve God. And so I found my grandmother's rosary. And the way that our bedroom was set up, you walked in the door and the bed sort of cut your view. And I would hide on the other side of the bed and pray the rosary so that if someone came in, I could throw it under the bed and pretend like I was exercising or something on the other <laughs> side of the bed like an idiot. But I, I prayed that rosary until I almost wore it smooth mm. and just asked the Blessed Mother to pray for me. Just pray for me. And as I entered into the mysteries of the rosary, I really understood what it meant to be in the presence of God. This longing that I had had for this depth of community with God, this, this real fellowship, this real face-to-face, -face, I found in my devotion to the rosary. You know, I would go through the, um, the joyful mysteries yeah. and I would just contemplate the nativity of the Lord. You know, and I love St. Luke, but, you know, and I always laugh when I teach this in RCIA, like, men, we love you, but, you know, Mary didn't just get on a donkey and go to Bethlehem and have a baby, right? Like, she was nine months pregnant on this donkey, and every door literally was closing when all she wanted to do was stay home and nest and welcome her baby. And she just had this incredible 
grace to just lean into God. And her yes was perpetual, right? right. Um, and I learned through that to trust yeah. God, that he had the place for me. Right. You know, think about the presentation of the Lord, how God had to orchestrate that. There's no way Simeon could have confessed his way, right, mm. into that moment of taking the creator of the universe into your arms and feeling that soft baby hair up against you and drinking in the scent of God himself and feeling that little baby heartbeat against you and thinking, God, how is this happening to me right now? You know, that's the reality of the presence of God. And we don't have to feel a way yeah. to tap into that. It's this grand irony, you know, and we have about four minutes left. Oh, so. wow. <laughs> but, Sorry. But, but the grand irony, right, of, 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 of that movement of trying to be anti-religion and be just so close to God. I, I'm, I'm relying all on God, casting it all on God. In the end, what does it come out to? It all ends up being of man and mm -hmm. my works and my words. And I, and I, whereas you have this great moment of, or this, 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 Re-encountering a faith where I really do step back and let God do the mm -hmm. work. Mm -hmm. So we've got about three and a half minutes left, but take us home. Where? <laughs> yeah. So yeah, um, yeah. I came into the church in March of wow. 2013. It was beautiful. It was wonderful. I was all by myself um, with my sponsor, um, and my priest was amazing. I came into a beautiful, wonderful, perfect parish, um, but I came into the church, and God just started to show up in this incredible way in my life. Um, you know, when I was married, we were poor. I ended up getting my marriage annulled. Um, and I always laugh and say, when I was married, we were poor. We didn't even go across the street. And within the first three years of my being in the church, I had to go to San Diego for a conference, and I went and put my hands in the Pacific Ocean. Then the next year, I went to Italy. Um, someone had graced me with a gift to go to Italy, and I put my feet in the Mediterranean Sea. And in my, in my prayer, in my contemplation, I just got this impression of the heart of God saying, I will bring you anywhere I want you. You could have never confessed your way to put your hands into the Pacific or your feet into the Mediterranean, but I did it. And you didn't lift a finger. You didn't do anything. Um, and that was probably my biggest lesson was learning to lean on God's plan to just serve him, to love him, to trust him. And to, you know, I was able to grow in charity because I was able to experience pain and empathize with people. And now the pain that I feel, you know, I always picture myself as sort of kneeling in the garden right beside the Lord and saying, I know you know how this feels. And so let me just kneel here with you and pray with you. Um, you know, it doesn't, my suffering isn't something for me to rebuke. It's for me to embrace. It's for me to use for self-examination. And it's for me to offer up. And say, you know, I'm part of this grand body. And so it's my way to connect with you, right? It's my way to say, hey, you know what? I get it. So let me show up in some way reminding you that God sees you, that God loves you, that this isn't for nothing, that he's working in you, that he's changing you, and that he's calling you to something higher, higher than confessing your way into some grand life. He's calling you to a renewal of your spirit. He's calling us into this grand family where what are we do in our lives means something and not where we walk in and everybody claps for us because we have the best thing on the block, right? Um, so that's, you know, probably not, not so much my whole story, but that's, you know, that's how I came into the church. Um, and it's been, you know, yes, do I still have days where I cry in the shower? Absolutely. Yes, yes, yes. Um, do I still have days where I'm, where I'm just overcome with sadness because, you know, I'm a person and I live in a body and I have kids and, and all the things, but I, I know that God's with me, whether I feel him or not, he's right, right here right. and he always has been, yeah. you know, he's, he's been rooting for me and I have this wonderful communion with the saints and I, I trust that they pray for me and, you know, that there are those witnesses who testify in my, on my behalf. Yeah. Um, so I've never felt you know, sometimes I go to Mass by myself, and I've never felt alone 
like I did in this communion with all these people and all this happening, I feel like I'm part of this wonderful mystical body. God has drawn close to us and in in the church we're able to draw close to him where we know he is. That's so beautiful. I, I have a thousand questions. And there's so much more, but what a beautiful testimony. Thank you so much, Lisa, for thank sharing you. it with us, sharing your heart with us. Thank you so much. It was my pleasure. And thank you for being here with us tonight uh, on this episode of the Journey Home Program. Um, I encourage you to go to chnetwork.org uh, for more stories like Lisa's. Again, there's, there's so many questions. There's so many uh, aspects of the story that are so fascinating. Um, but remember, you're on a journey. Draw close to God. Trust in Him. I know you've been edified by Lisa's story like I have and encouraged. Stay close to Him. We'll be back next week with another story. God bless you. We'll see you then.